Welcome back to Outdoors Type, and I'm going to do something a little bit different in this video. I'm going to retell a story which is actually a journal entry by a man named Walter Jordan. Um, it's featured here in this book um, called um, Memoirs of Early Coffs Harbour, Journal Entries by Walter G. Jordan. These journal entries have been collated by Denise Hunter. Uh, these provide an excellent insight into life around the pioneering time of the Coffs Harbour region. So, let's get straight into the story. In the first place, many months before the bridge was built, the Boring Gang under a Mr Sauron tested the depth the rock was down. He told me himself that in places there was 45 feet of sand and that the cylinder would have to sit on the rock to be permanent, but when the bridge was built, evidently the plan was altered and 20 feet piles were driven into the sand. I don't know exactly how many poles were driven in a bunch, but I think about a dozen. They were driven about two or three feet below the sand, then about two more feet of sand was cleared away from them and the concrete piece built on top of the piles. Of course, I know nothing about this manner of building pieces on top of piles, but knowing those coastal creeks for years, I condemned the system at once. The funny part of the thing was that where the sounding showed 45 feet, the piles driven said they had struck rock before they could drive 20 feet piles and had to cut them off, and thereafter cut 20 foot piles in the middle and drive bunches of 10 feet piles only. Most of these piles came off my selection, so I know what I'm talking about. When these piles were cut in the middle to 10 feet lengths, I cut many of them as I was working on the bridge at the time. Very shortly after the piles had been finished and the dam, as they are called, was taken away, of course the run of water washed a deep hole around these piers. Soon the hole was 6 or 7 feet deep, and the f up to 4 or 5 feet of the piles could be seen under the concrete, thus allowing for 2 feet of the pile in concrete and 5 feet of those 10 feet piles showing below and left only three feet of piles in the sand. One day I was alongside the middle pier in my boat and I caught hold of it to hold my boat while the train passed. To my great surprise, I distinctly felt the whole pier shake and roll. I immediately reported the whole thing to the railway authority and was practically told to mind my own business. They said the bridge was built on the latest system and that it was simply the vibration that I felt and that to send in such a report of an impossible happening was and always had been a great source of annoyance to the railway department. They said in future to make sure of my statements before reporting them. This of course was a smack in the eye and I felt very nasty about the matter. Many a time I've taken persons to watch the bridge while the train passed and from the bank it could easily be seen rolling. The whole of the northern part Shortly afterwards, one or two drivers reported the bridge unsafe, but no notice was taken. About this time, the inspector of fishery was out at Boambi and had brought his father with him. This was Mr Smithers, who was a police magistrate in Sydney for many years. In conversation, I mentioned the state of the bridge to him. He asked me to take him out in my boat and so that he could see for himself. This I did and showed him at least six feet of the piles showing and with a boat hook, I pulled big chunks out of some of them to show how rotten they were. He said he would go straight to the heads when he went to Sydney and report what he had seen. He made a special request for the driver of the train he was in to go slow over the bridge. I might say that I had again reported the condition of the bridge to the railway people, pointing out that a terrible accident would soon occur. Again, I got no reply. A few days after Mr Smithers left, one of the settlers came up to me, and told me the big engineers were up and they wanted me in a boat so they could see for themselves. I went down and waited most of the day for them and it was many hours with them and although I put in a claim for a day's expenses, I got nothing. Four high hats came and one big man took me to task straight away. I understand his name was Simpson. Up to me he came with, I understand you're a farmer named Jordan and that you've been writing a lot of rubbish about the bridge. Well, that annoyed me greatly, and I went for him like hell. I asked him why they wouldn't investigate my reports. He said they were too silly to consider as the bridge was built on the specifications of the greatest experts in Australia. He then got reading those specifications. One said the piers were built in 20-foot iron bark piers. 
I immediately told him that there was not one iron bar pier under the concrete. He turned to the others and said, What is the use of talking to this man? He does not know pine from iron bark. I told him I was a bush worker all my life, and I knew my timbers like my ABC, and that every pile under the piers were turpentine, and I had cut most of them off my own place. I also said that I had cut them into ten foot lengths after being brought to the bridge, and that the pile drivers had reported striking rock at ten feet where the boring showed forty five feet. We have the report of Mr. Lawson, he said. Fetch them out, to one, who was evidently a clerk of some sort. In a few minutes he was going through them and frowning darkly. Then he asked me if I knew what the depth of the boring was under the other piers. I told him, and then they muttered amongst themselves for a while and they'd said, According to these boring reports you are quite right. Something terrible has happened and we must get further reports, but those piles are iron bar. They're specially specified. I said, jump in the boat, and I'll soon show you. It was low tide. I anchored the boat, and with the boat hook, tore off big pieces from the piles where they were showing under the piers. How's that for iron bark? I asked. Then I pulled off chunks of cobra-eaten wood off the piles. I noticed one of those piles was swinging and just hanging in the concrete. I struck the boat hook firmly into it and gave it to Simpson and told him to shake the pile. It would wobble about everywhere. To say he was dumbfounded was not saying much. While he looked at it in a dazed sort of way, a drummer fish with a big scar near its tail swam in amongst the piles and went out the other side. Good God, he said, it just went through the piers. Just then we heard the rumble of the train coming, and I grabbed up the catch and pulled away from my life. Watch the bridge, I sang out, and we could easily see it moving. Simpson said, put me ashore as quick as you can. He scribbled a note, gave it to the fettler, and said, Wait not a second in delivering that. Then they walked away a bit and were talking and pointing and gesticulating between themselves and finally went to their trikes and away without one look in my direction. Nor did I ever hear a word from them. The next train crawled over the bridge and for many months afterwards. In a few days a gang of men came and they threw hundreds of bags of cement into the holes around the piers then great copper dams were built around them and cleaned out for ten feet or so and all filled with concrete. That is the position today and it appears as if a permanent job has been done of it now. The above is the truth about Boambi Bridge and it goes to show what great bungling is done by the heads of the department and of course in most cases we never hear anything of it. That's the end of that journal entry from uh, Walter Jordan, telling it like it uh, was back then, uh, around 1915. Um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, video. It's been a little bit of a different style for me. If you did, then give me a thumbs up and let me know what you liked in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Catch you then.